now we should start the recording. All right. But in any case, uh, again, as we've uh, been studying the Psalms uh, before each of our classes, uh, we've now uh, com really completed the book of Psalm. We've read every Psalm uh, over the last uh, less than a year, maybe about a year in total, but 150 uh, chapters in all, and some of them were very long, so we broke them up over time. But here in this last psalm, it's a great psalm of praise to our Lord, and it's a psalm uh, that we should take uh, dear and near to our hearts. It's about six verses, so let's read it right now. In verse 1, it says, Praise the Lord, praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty expanse. Praise Him for His mighty deeds. Praise Him according to His excellent greatness. Praise Him with trumpet sound. Praise Him with harp and lyre. Praise Him with timbrel and dancing. Praise Him with stringed instruments and pipe. So therefore, you can have all kinds of instruments when we praise the Lord and have our music ministry, and uh, there's no limits to that. In verse 4, uh, let's see, in verse 5, praise Him with loud cymbals, praise Him with resounding cymbals. Again, loud noise is a good thing, too, when we praise the Lord. In verse 6, it says, let everything that has br uh, breath praise the Lord, praise the Lord. So again, a great psalm of praise as we wrap up, really, a book of praise to our Lord God, again, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. All right, let's turn now to Ephesians chapter 6 in our Bibles. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 6. And as you know, we've been uh, studying uh, Ephesians chapter 6, and specifically now getting close to uh, finishing up this chapter, which also will conclude the book. But recently we've talked about picking up and putting on the full armor of God that really began back in verse 10 and brought us down through verse 17. And now that we've seen all the equipment that God has for us, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, again, that sword of the spirit, the gospel of peace, all of those things, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, everything that God has given to us, all emanating and stemming from his word, is really speaking about putting on Jesus Christ, having the Christ-like nature in our soul and in in our heart where Christ is at home in you. And basically that is accomplished when we take in the Word of God on a consistent basis and then apply it. But even with all of that, we are now seeing in this passage, in the verse of study today, in verse 18, that we have another aspect of our worship and praise and our spiritual walk that we need to also uh, hold near and dear to our heart, and that is our prayer life. And we'll be talking about that in just a minute. But remember, as we have this fourth overall point, now we're talking about the energy that God gives to us to win the battle of the spiritual warfare of this angelic conflict that we all are a part of. And here we have that energy that is given to us in verses 18 through 20, and that energy is really our prayer life. And that's what we're noting this morning, and that's what we'll continue to note over the next couple of lessons that we're together. <clears throat> because as we've already noted, prayer makes effective the full armor of God so that we can walk victoriously. Remember, positionally, we already have victory in Jesus Christ. We have salvation. We have eternal security. That was won for us at the cross. And when we believed in Jesus Christ as our Savior, but then experientially in our daily walk, are you walking victoriously every day or are you walking like a defeated individual? Are you walking with depression, fear, worry, and anxiety within your life? How are you walking every day? You should be walking victoriously. And to walk victoriously, you need to be victorious, which means you need to win the battles over your soul and not allow sin and Satan in the world to beat you down. Instead, be lifted up by the Word of God, be lifted up by the full armor of God, and also be lifted up by the prayer life that you have between you and God. And the great blessing that God has given to us to be able to pray to Him. Remember, the unbeliever can't pray to Him other than, I believe in Jesus Christ. That's the only prayer that the unbeliever can pray. But you and I can pray for all things, in all aspects, and in all occasions within our lives. And that's what this verse has told us thus far as we uh, went through it uh, in the exegesis, again looking at the Greek and coming forward to the English translation. But let's uh, look at it once again in verse 18. It says, with all prayer and petition. What is that with all talking about? The full armor of God, standing victoriously, standing against the schemes of the devil every day. We do that with all prayer and petition. Prayer is the general uh, uh, things that we offer up to God, which includes thanksgiving and worship, confession of our sins, whatever the case. But petition is the specific 
type of special prayer that we have where we can ask God for specific things within our lives. And also the intercessory prayer where we pray specifically for other people in our lives as well. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times. Not just once in a while, not just on Sunday, not when you just come to church, not when you just have a big crisis in your life, but at all times. The good times and the bad times. And we do this in the filling of God the Holy Spirit. It says, and with this in view, all of that prayer, the ability to be able to pray, it says, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. So in the first half of the verse, it talks about praying for ourselves and our own spiritual walk in worship of God. But the second half of this verse talks about us locking our shields together. Locking our shields like the Roman soldiers used to do and when they went out on the battlefield and collectively would defend against the enemy and collectively would fight against the enemy. And that's what you and I are to do as we come together in prayer, both corporately when we do this like we did this morning, but also individually when we pray for one another. We're locking our shields as members of the body of Christ and going forward in the spiritual warfare, not just for ourselves and the benefit of ourselves, but for the benefit of the greater collective body of Jesus Christ. So <clears throat> when we went through this verse, we understood what the context is all about, what the individual meaning is all about. And this morning, I want to delve you a little bit deeper into what prayer truly is. And I'm going to give you the example of Jesus Christ in just a minute as we turn to the Gospel of Luke and understand how Jesus Christ instructed his disciples how to pray. But a unanimous writer once wrote, the secret of all failure is our failure in secret prayer. That's a very powerful and a very what we call pregnant verse. There's a lot of meaning inside of that. The secret of all failure is our failure in secret prayer. You see, we're not talking about uh, ultimately failure to pray in this verse, but we're talking about in our failure of how to pray. You see, when we get before our Lord, how should we be praying? And as you're going to see, I'm not talking about the mechanics here. I'm talking about the mental attitude. I'm talking about the motivation that we have. What is right with God is how we should be operating and functioning within our life. And therefore, if we don't go to God with an open attitude, with a prayerful attitude, with a childlike nature, coming to our Father and asking for things from our Father with a loving heart, with an open heart, with eyes wide open as to how he's going to answer that prayer, we are then failing in our prayer. And again, our secret prayer. You see, it's one thing to go out in prayer, and as uh, we, uh, we are going to see in an example coming up of the Pharisee who said, hey, look at my prayer, and let me pray about this, and let me pray about that, so that everybody could hear him, and everybody could understand how great and wonderful he was. You see, many times when people pray, especially in open format, it's all about them rather than it being about God. And so therefore, when we don't have the right mental attitude, when we don't have the right motivation, when we truly don't know how to pray, we are failing in our prayer life, which is going to lead us to fail in our spiritual life. And therefore, if we want to have victory inside the body of Jesus Christ, if we want to have victory picking up and putting on the full armor of God, we need to know how to pray. Not just the mechanics of, I've got to do this and I've got to do that and check the list off here and there, but what is the mental attitude, what's the motivation behind our prayer? You see, the reason we so often fall into sin or live in discouragement, live in defeat, live in fear, worry, or anxiety inside of Satan's cosmic system, inside of Satan's world, the reason we don't produce divine good on a consistent basis as we should or even as we desire to is because of our failure to pray to God, our failure to turn to God, our failure to look to God. And as I say up on the board, failure to cling to God. You see, we need to cling to God on a daily basis. We need to cling to God not just when we come to church and not just when the crisis is coming and I don't know what to do, so I'm going to cling to God now and let me try to grasp at the rope of God. Let me try to grab that anchor so that ultimately I don't get washed away. Yes, we can do those things, but you see, our daily walk isn't just about the crisis situation and the moment. You see, our daily walk is about everything that we're doing. 
in our entire life whether we're taking care of the kids at home, whether we're you know, going to the beach on a nice summer day, or whether we're going to our jobs on the weekdays that we have to work, or whatever days we have to work. You see, everything that we do is a moment to share it with God, to cling to God as we go forward. And our prayer life is reflective of that spiritual walk that we have with God. You see, we do not did, <laughs> diligently seek Him or learn on him, or lean on him, or plead with him, or draw on his strength. You see, when we don't do that, that's when we have failure inside of our prayer life. You see, all aspects of our prayer life should be about God, and clinging to him, and knowing that he is the all-powerful God, the omnipotent one, the all-knowing one, the omniscient one, knowing who and what God is. And then also, knowing ourselves. You see, we're going to read a little bit about Jesus Christ when he was here on planet Earth and some of the things that he did. And we're going to learn about the mental attitude that Jesus Christ had and how he clung to the Father, even though he was what? God. But yet, who was he when he was here on planet Earth? He was a man. You see, he didn't lose his deity, we know that but he did not utilize his deity to solve his own problems. And he functioned and operated, just as you and I do, as members of the human race. And therefore, he recognized his weaknesses, his potential for failure. He recognized that he could not do all things. And he recognized in his humanity, there was very little power that he actually had, compared especially to the deified power of God and the deified power that he had, again, uh, uh, not put aside, but was not usual, utilizing, so that he could show us what it meant to be a man, or a woman, we could say. So when we do not diligently seek him, lean on him, cling on him, draw on his strength, that's when we start to have problems in our spiritual life. And if you are an individual and you say, well, I prayed for this, but I have no answer to that, why not? Well, we know there are several reasons for that, but many times the first reason is because of your motivation and attitude in that prayer. When you didn't have the heart of God as you were offering that thing up, and it was more about you and the problem and getting you out of a situation or your lusts and your desires that you are giving to God and saying, God, I want this thing. And God says, that thing is probably not what you is not what you need right now. So again, we have to understand what it means to have a great prayer life and to offer that up to God. And if we feel like our prayers are not being answered, we can't be looking to God and saying, "God, why aren't you answering my prayers?" because God always answers the prayer of his righteous ones. He always answers it. And many times he answers maybe no. And if you seem like you're getting a lot of no answers, that means you're really not walk, walking right with God. Because God is not a God that wants to say no to you all the time. He's a God who wants to say yes. But the yes has come when we recognize who God is and what his greater plan is for our life and for the life of other people around us. When we have a mental attitude not about ourselves but about others and God, our prayer life is going to change dramatically. But unfortunately, many times we give ourselves over to the busyness of world, or busyness of the world, the busyness of everyday life. And we're all caught up in, I've got to do this and I've got to do that. And many times we don't even think about praying because we're all caught up in the stuff that we have to do and what we're involved in. And what do we lose out on when we're all caught up in our busyness, as we like to say here in New England with our go, 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 all hopped up on Dunkin' Donuts coffee? What do we lose out in that busyness? We lose out on our relationship with God, our communion with God. Because we're so caught up in ourselves and what we're doing and how we're doing and what I have and what I don't have and the stuff of this world that we're forgetting about our relationship with God. And unfortunately, then we start to pray about us and ourselves and our wants, our lusts, our needs, and our desires. 
and we forget. You know, and all of us, you know, I'll include myself in this, we all get caught up in the doing and thinking that we're going to do something for God or I'm going to fix this problem or I'm going to do this thing over here or I'm going to do that thing over there. And sometimes we even think we're going to do it for God, but we forget about God and God really doing it for us and through us. And we forget about the prayer life as we go out to do his work. So again, we can't forget who God is. We can't forget about our relationship with him. We can't forget about his power, his authority. We can't forget about his knowledge. You know, God knows what's going to happen to you tomorrow. I don't, you don't. But he does. He already knows. So why aren't we looking to him? for the problems and the solutions, or, or the solutions to the problems of what today or even tomorrow is going to bring. He already knows it, and he's known it for a thousand, million, billion, trillion years. He's known it forever. So ultimately, this is all demonstrated for us. Let's turn to the Gospel of Luke chapter 18. Let's go to the Gospel of Luke chapter 18. And here we see both the negative and the positive aspect of what the prayer life should be. And in Luke chapter 18, again, we get back to uh, down to verse 11 through 14 specifically. And then Jesus in verse 10, it says, Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax gatherer, a tax collector as we would call it. Again, uh, and in the early, uh, you know, the days of, uh, of the writing of the Bible, remember the Jews hated the tax collector because they were working for the Romans to collect money for them. But the Pharisees, oh, they were the, oh, they were the good guys. Oh, let's look at them. Let's, you know, let's give them the favor. But this other guy over here, nah, he's not so great. It says the Pharisee stood and was praying. And it says thus to himself, or we could say about himself. He says, God, I thank you that I am not like the other people's, uh, other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. Oh, aren't I just a wonderful person? Thank you, God, for not making me a wicked, wretched, rotten wretch. Okay? <laughs> thank you, God, that I'm not a scumbag. Okay? And say that. I'm not like the rest of them. I'm above everybody else. And then he goes on in verse 12. He says, I fast twice a week. I, pray, I pay tithes of all that I get. But the tax gatherer, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. And then Jesus comes back, he says, I tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself shall be humbled, but he who humbles himself shall be exalted. And remember, we're all sinners, every single one of us, and we will continue to be sinners until the day we die. Then we'll be translated to perfection at that point. But we are sinners. And we should never have an attitude, no matter how good we think we might be. Certainly that we're better than the rest. But even better than the rest, or just to think of, well, I'm a spiritual individual. I go to church. I read the Bible. I study. I apply. I must be pretty good. But you see, when we start to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think, that will also then lend us to not pray as we should. Because now we become self-dependent rather than dependent upon our Lord. We think that we're doing it right or we're doing it good or I've got this down and I've got that down. Even if you've been studying the Word of God for 50 years, again, we still need to recognize I am a sinner and I have faults and frailties and weaknesses and all kinds of things, because I'm a member of the human race, plain and simple. Again, it's not, 
a woe is me and negative attitude towards yourself, but it's just a self-recognition, the humble recognition of who and what we are. And God, guess what? Knows that, <laughs> right? He knew that we would be weak and frail. He knew we would have sin in our lives. He knew we would have a sin nature that would dog us throughout our days here on planet Earth. And with all that knowledge, he said, you know what? I'm going to do something to overcome that. And I'm going to help them. I'm going to provide for them. I'm going to care for them. I'm going to lead them. I'm going to work for them. I'm going to do for them. But he only does that when we ask him to. You see, he's a gentleman. He can't override our free will. And if we don't ask God for all things, unfortunately, it's like I like to say, we're giving a stiff arm to God. Nope, don't need you right now. Whether it's intentional or unintentional. Most of our stiff arms to God are very unintentional. We just think we've got it all down, we've got it all right, and I'm good, and I'm okay, and I'm just going to do my own thing here. And we don't turn to God. You see, this individual, the, the Pharisee, wasn't really concerned about his relationship with God. He was more concerned about himself. Am I walking spiritually? Am I a good Christian? Am I doing the right things? Oh, and by the way, I am better than everybody else. Okay. See how that, you know, one leads to the other. But his relationship with God, even though he was praying to God, really wasn't about God. It was about himself. And therefore, God really wasn't hearing his prayer. Now remember, God hears everything. He knows everything, okay? So I'm not talking about, you know, the sound waves coming into his ear and him comprehending it. I'm talking about him receiving that prayer and then therefore answering that prayer as he does. And the fact is, is because he really never was right with God. And there are many Christians like this today. They're really not right with God. Because it's about them and their stuff and their things and what's going on in their life. As subtle or as egregious that may be. Most of the time it's very, very, very subtle. But it excluded one key ingredient. Your will be done. You see, that's our attitude that we should have. God, your will be done. Not my will. Not that I want this or that or the other thing, but God, what do you want to be done here today? What do you want done when I go to the beach? What do you want done when I uh, go, uh, 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 let me say this, when I go to the movies? And I prayed that prayer. And I went to the movies a couple weeks ago and I met these two fine individuals who have joined us today. Because God's will was done. And the witness went out. What's your will when I go to work? What's your will when I do the chores around the house? God, what's your will? And your will be done. It's not about me, myself, and Irene, okay? But it's about God. And that's the key ingredient we need to have. You see, when our prayer time involves relinquishing our grip on our own personal desires and abandoning ourselves to God, then our prayers are on target. But it's only with that mental attitude. And again, you know, I'm not trying to browbeat anybody here. I don't have anybody in mind when I talk about these things, and I don't want you to think that you're all doing stuff wrong. Okay? All right? What I'm trying to do is draw you closer to God. Because that's what we're here to do every day. Draw closer to God. Let's get our relationship with Him straight and let's develop that relationship beyond all others and I know many of you are great prayers but there's always something we can improve upon to develop our relationship with God even more so and that's what this is all about and that's why after getting all that armor all that stuff of power and strength that God has for us then what does he say hit your knees and pray and when we pray, it's not, let me take my shield and beat the enemy into submission. Or let me take my sword and let me run them through. 
to their dead. No, we hit our knees and said, God, this is your armor, this is your equipment. I just happen to be wearing it right now. How do you want me to utilize this? For what purpose? To serve? To defend? How do you want me to do this? And what do you want me to do in this situation? A fellow by the name of, of Victor Hugo, he says, prayer then is an attitude of the heart that humbles itself before a living God, silently declaring, I need you. And do we say that in our lives? Do we say, God, I need you? Probably do. That's why most of us are here today. Okay. But how often do you say that? How often do you say, God, I need you? And again, that's not a submission of you know, failure or anything like that just a submission of dependency on God, who is the all-knowing, all-powerful, all all-sovereign, all-just, all-righteous, all-loving God. Just a recognition, I need you, God. Because I know that, you know, I have faults, I have failures. We all have different personalities, don't we? Do we like everybody's personality in the world? No, we don't. <laughs> You think everybody loves your personality in the world? No, I'm not sure. <laughs> so the fact that we can recognize who and what we are is Jesus recognized who and what he was as a man on planet Earth. He said, God, I need you. And he lived a life of God, I need you. You see, and that's kind of where we're getting with all of this. It's not just saying the words, but it's having it in the mentality of your soul. That, God, I need you. You know, it's not a formula, you know. This isn't a magical incantation. You know? A lot of that given to us in the Bible. Go talk to the witch of Endor. You, know, you can talk to her a little bit. You can go to your palm reader down the street or the psychic up, up and down, okay. With all these magical incantations. That's not what prayer is. Yes, there are things we should be doing. Again, Matthew 6, Jesus gives a template of the prayer life. But it's not following the template that makes it a magical mystery tour. Okay? It's the mental attitude of, God, I need you. God, I want you. God, I desire you to be in my life. God, I want to do for you in this moment. Nor is it expressly designed for the crisis. Yes, it's there for the crisis, absolutely, don't, you know, don't deny that. But prayer isn't exclusive for the crisis, which many people utilize it as. Just when the problem comes up, now we're going to pray. Lord, help me. A fellow by the name of James Hudson Taylor once said, when we work, we work. But when we pray, God works. You see, that's the attitude we should have in our lives. You know, is it all about you and what you're doing for God, or is it God working for you in your life and then through you? And that's the busyness. You know, when we work, we work. That's the busyness of life. And we think and we get, you know, so caught up in, I can solve this problem. I can do this thing. I can do that thing. But really, does God want you to do that? Have you ever stepped back and said, does God want me to do this? Or is it just that, I'm going to do this. And then you go forward. Our Lord Jesus Christ demonstrated how prayer is all about, and he demonstrated what this life is all about, certainly in John chapter 14. Let's turn there. Let's look at John chapter 14. We're going to come back to Luke in just a minute. Let's turn to John chapter 14. verses 12 through 13. And just to go back before that in verse, uh, in verse 11, 
It says, believe me, that I am in the Father and the Father in me. Otherwise, believe on account of the works themselves. You know, Jesus isn't saying, hey, look at my works. He's basically saying, look what the Father has done. And he's doing that through me. In verse 12, truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, shall he do also. In greater works than these shall he do, because I go to the Father. In other words, his ministry is about to end. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And then it says in verse 14, it says, If you ask, and the word me should not be there, it's not in the original language. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Remember, we pray to God the Father in the name of Jesus Christ. But if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. And again, ask the Father, and Jesus Christ will do the work. Just as when Jesus Christ was here on planet Earth, he was praying to the Father, and the Father was doing the work. Jesus was just the conduit in which the Father did the work through. He also spoke that to the disciples very similarly in chapter 15, verse 7. And then in 1 John chapter 5, in verse 14 through 15, the, the uh, you know, Apostle John, the disciple at the time of uh, Jesus' ministry, became, becoming the ap great apostle, he then wrote, he understood this. And then he writes to the church through the Holy Spirit, this is the confidence which we have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Again, your will be done. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests which we have asked from him. You see, God wants you to have confidence in your prayer life. But that confidence in your prayer life can only come when you have that relationship with the Father, when you are walking intimately with him and recognizing it's not my will, but your will be done. You see, when it's all about my will be done, not your will be done, when it's about my will be done, then our prayer life goes astray. Our spiritual life is already astray because of that attitude. But when we ask, your will be done, Father, he hears us and he answers that prayer every time. Remember, Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane prayed, Father, if there's any way, take this cup from me, but not my will, but your will be done. The Father's answer in that case was, no, I'm not taking that cup. You know that I brought you here to take that cup and run with that cup called the cross. And Jesus recognized that. But truly what was in Jesus' heart is, Father, help me through this. You know, it's going to be a tough thing. It's going to be a difficult thing. I don't want to have to go through this if I don't have to. And that's the case for a lot of the things we go through in life. I don't want to have to go through this if I don't have to. Take this from me. But yet with the humble recognition, not my will, but your will be done. If you want me to go through this, then, Father, strengthen me, empower me, enable me, and help me to see why. And also help me to recognize that you are there with me in this entire walk. You see, the vision and discipline of biblical praying has really escaped the body of Christ, certainly, in, I believe, in our day and age. When we talk about, yeah, we need to pray, we need to pray, we need to pray, but many times we don't understand the reality of our prayer life. Now let's turn back to Luke chapter 11. And we're going to go through this chapter and understand a little bit of the principles in regard to our prayer life. But there was something very interesting that begins this chapter that led Jesus into really explaining what prayer is all about. In Luke chapter 11 and verse 1 it says, And it came about that while he was praying in a certain place, again Jesus, after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John also taught his disciples. That's as much as I'm going to read. <laughs> Lord, teach us how to pray. It's interesting that, you know, these disciples never asked Jesus, teach us how to preach. 
Teach us how to heal. Teach us how to perform miracles. Teach us how to speak in foreign languages so that we can witness to others. You see, they never asked, teach us how to do anything else in the ministry. But they did ask, teach us how to pray. And there's a lot involved in that question. You see, Lord, teach us how to pray is that they were witnessing something different about how Jesus was, was praying. And also we see uh, you know, John the Baptist in view there too, where he taught his disciples how to pray. Because they saw in John the Baptist an intimacy of relationship in him that they never saw in anybody else. You see, these guys and, and, and the people of those days, they saw the Pharisees praying all the time. They saw what that prayer was like. And even though they could use, you know, very big words and, you know, have all this, you know, you know, do it by the letter of the law or whatever the case may be and look very powerful and, you know, look very confident in what they're doing. They saw something different in the prayer of John and now in the prayer of Jesus. You see, they witnessed these guys praying and they asked Jesus, teach us how to pray. You don't think these guys knew how to pray? You don't think they knew to offer up to God? You don't think they knew about the confession of sin? You don't think they knew about the details of praying? Absolutely, they knew these things. But Lord, teach us how to pray. I remember some years back, uh, it was the, um, I don't know if that was the bicentennial or some centennial for the town of Plainville, and they had different events going on, and uh, they asked me as a, a pastor in this town, along with the other clergy from the town, to come and do a prayer at uh, one of the gatherings that they had and do an opening prayer. And I did the first prayer, and I get up there, and I spoke from my heart, and I prayed for the town and the people and, you know, whatever, whatever else, God's blessings on it and everything. And another member of the clergy got up that's part of a denomination, and basically he read a poem. Much more eloquent than my prayer. Probably didn't have a, 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 a stutter like I had, okay, as I do from time to time, okay, but much more eloquent. And people, ah, oh, isn't that wonderful? <laughs> and mine are like, who's this guy? <laughs> you see, I was the tax collector. <laughs> That's why I'm so rich today. No, just kidding. I'm not rich. <laughs> but Lord, teach us how to pray. It's not about the words that we say or even how we go about doing it. It's all about the relationship that we have with the Lord Jesus Christ and with God the Father himself. And you see, the disciples witnessed that in Jesus. And they wanted that. And if you've witnessed somebody in your life that has a fervency for prayer, and you see their faith just exuding, and their love for the Lord just coming forward, if you've ever witnessed that, you've probably said to yourself, how can I have some of that? You know, how can I get me some of that, as we like to say? Lord, teach us how to pray. And that's what our Lord does is, as we continue on in the coming week. We're going to go through uh, the rest of this book, but again, just to give us some of that answer. You see, it was his attitude in his prayer that his whole life was just what saturated and consumed. His whole being was all about your will be done. His every step, his every action was about being in the step and action of God the Father. You see, it's all about that intimacy that we have in our heart with God that then teaches us how to pray. But if we don't have the intimacy with God in our heart, we're not going to really know how to pray. But at the same time, we thank God because what, we, as we studied last week, the Holy Spirit's there for us as well. And we can't lose sight of that. That we don't know how to pray as we ought to pray, as Romans chapter 8 tells us, but the Holy Spirit is there. So the grace of God is there even when we truly don't know how to pray. But yet, we should learn more and more every day how to pray. And it's not reading some mechanics on 
you know, do this prayer, do that prayer. It's not doing the stations of the cross or, you know, walking on your knees up some hill until you get to nirvana or whatever the case, okay? It's not that. It's what's going on in the menta mentality of your soul. What's going on in your relationship with God? What do you think about God? And how is that relationship going within your life? You see, it gets represented, it gets exuded in our prayer life. You see, the Lord had a deep dependency on God. Even though he was God. Isn't that interesting? But he had a deep dependency on God the Father. And we kind of ask ourselves, and I think I've got this in your notes for you as well, but, you know, what did Jesus Christ accomplish on this earth? And the answer to that is nothing. You see, the humanity of Jesus Christ accomplished nothing on this earth. But you see, God the Father working through him accomplished everything. Because Jesus Christ had that intimate relationship with the Father. He had that intimate fellowship, that intimate walk. And he had the attitude of your will be done. Not my will, but your will be done. And therefore, the Father accomplished much through him. He accomplished incredible things through him. And these disciples could not be true disciples unless they learned also to have that same kind of intimacy as Jesus Christ did. Another passage in Luke chapter 6, verse 40. It says, The disciple will never be greater than his teacher, but when the teacher does his job and the disciple learns from the teacher, he will be like the teacher. In other words, we're never going to be greater than Jesus Christ, but we can be like Jesus Christ. And as Jesus Christ demonstrated his prayer life to his disciples and to us as well as we see in the word of God, we too can have that type of intimate relationship. We too can have that type of walk with God. And so that every prayer we answer or we offer up to God is answered in the positive realm because it's always God's will being done. It says truly truly I say to you the son of man can do nothing of himself. This is Jesus talking about himself. He can't do anything by himself unless it is something he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does these things the son also does in like manner. Is your life filled with seeing what the Father is doing? Is your life filled with seeing the will of God the Father? Or is your life filled with always having to look back over your shoulder and say, oh, what happened there? What happened here? Do you have a vision of what's going to happen in the future? And I'm not talking about, you know, soothsaying but knowing how God works and seeing things come together, you can understand and recognize that and then be a part of that. Again, it's what the Father does through us. Let me give you a couple more things and we'll be done. Prayer basically was his way of life. It was the way of life of Jesus. And it was an absolute necessity. See, prayer life is sometimes the second, the third, the last thing we think of in desperation but it's a necessity of all things because it's a recognition of the father and the relationship that we have with him and the power that he has for us moment by moment in matthew 12 18 behold my servant whom i have chosen the father said of jesus christ my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased i will put my spirit upon him and he shall proclaim justice to the Gentiles. You see, what's that, all that saying? Is that, yeah, he was pleased with Jesus Christ, but basically the Spirit's going to be working through him. The Spirit of the Father be working through him to accomplish all things. And then, let me just, I've got these in the notes, kind of getting short on time. But it's very, very interesting, and we'll pick this up on Tuesday night, how when Jesus went to perform his great miracles, when he raised Lazarus from the dead, when he took the fish and loaves of bread and fed 5,000, 
when he chose his disciples. And in the notes, you'll see that one. You know, when he chose the disciples, he wasn't reviewing their qualifications. Are they going to be good disciples of mine because they have X, Y, and Z? No, what do we see him doing? Praying to the Father. When he raised Lazarus, what do we see him doing? Looking heavenly, which means he was praying to the Father. And the same with the loaves of bread. His life was of prayer. And he recognized that he could not do these things on his own, but he also recognized that the Father can do all things. And that's where we should be looking within our lives as well. All right, so on Tuesday we'll talk in, uh, more about our prayer life and expanding that. So let's just bow our heads in prayer right now. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for off, uh, giving us this opportunity to offer up these prayers to you. We thank you for the word that you have given to us this day the fruits of your labor that are coming through us each and every day. And Father, we continue to pray that you increase our faith, which means you increase our walk with you, our knowledge of you, and also our prayer life with you. And Father, we just ask that your will continue to be done through us and through this church to your glory. In Christ's precious name, amen.